Well, we're back at it again. I've played two more demos following the most recent Nintendo Direct, and naturally I'm going to share my thoughts on them. The first one I played was Octopath Traveler 2, and before I even get into the commentary, I'm just going to tell you to buy the game. Like, right now. For reference, I came back on Thursday night after work and I was knackered. I had every intention of playing the game for an hour and then calling it a night. Instead, I ended up playing for the full length of time that was on offer and it flew by without me even realising. I was hooked, I didn't want it to end, and now I'm going to tell you why. Octopath Traveler 2's demo, or prologue as they call it, is surprisingly liberal as far as demos go. It gives you three hours to partake in its world, but you're pretty much free to do whatever you want during that window. From the off, you're given a choice of eight characters across the land to begin your journey with, and choosing one will allow you to see their backstory which eventually leads to the beginning of their journey. Once that is completed, you are thrust into the world to simply explore. And that's one thing I was hooked on straight away, this feeling of making your own adventure. There was just so much to do right off the bat and a vast array of areas to explore. The zones themselves weren't massive, but they didn't need to be in a game like this, and they utilised the 2.5D style very well with a decent amount of hidden items for those willing to go off the beaten path. However, it's also enriched further through the characters themselves. Every character has their own unique path action, and the one that is available depends on whether it is night or day. For example, Hikari during the day can challenge civilians to gain new abilities, or at night can bribe them which aids in the completion of side quests. Particio, on the other hand, has a completely different set of skills as befitting a merchant, and I can only see this facet becoming more engrossing the further I go in. I can't wait to see how many possibilities open up and what I can find just through these abilities alone. Now, there are a couple of small nitpicks here too. The Switch version has some frame drops here and there when the weather effects become more pronounced, which I think is to be expected with Switch hardware nowadays anyway. Good thing it's on other platforms to hopefully alleviate that issue. You'll also notice quite quickly that you can't save wherever you want, you can only do so at one of these pedestals, and even more egregious, there's only one save slot. That's probably my biggest gripe of the game so far. Lastly, the encounter rate is a touch too high for my liking. It's apparently affected by how often you dash around on the overmap, but even at a normal running pace it was quite trigger happy. Maybe that'll be addressed via one of those path actions I mentioned earlier. But even if the encounter rate is high, at least it leads to an enjoyable battle system. Yeah, I had a blast with it. First of all, I want to say I'm very happy that the game offers a fast mode in combat. Even in systems I enjoy, it's nice to have that option when you're looking to grind or just get to a location faster, so good on you there, developers. Now, as for the combat itself, it uses a very simple base but just feels super gratifying to use. It's a turn-based system that has all the options you would expect, standard attacks, item usage, skill usage, and defending, but it's also centred around this break and boost mechanic. Enemies you fight will display a shield counter. If you hit an enemy's weakness, the shield counter will drop, and when it falls to zero, they will no longer be able to act in the next round of combat, not to mention they will take more damage. Once this opportunity is exploited, you can call on the second half of the system, the boost mode. Every round of combat yields one boost counter to all active members in your party, stacking to a maximum of five. By pressing the right bumper, you can spend one of these counters to boost your next ability, either in terms of how frequently you strike an enemy, or indeed the damage you put out. And you can stack this to a maximum of three. The more boost counters you use, the greater the effect. And it's not just your skills these boost counters can be used with. Every party member also has a unique latent ability that range from powerful techniques to maxing out your boost counters, adding yet more options for the player. And ultimately, that's what I love about this system, is that it's not overly complex, but you can see the strategic elements is there, and I can only imagine that as you get more characters, it will only grow in depth in line with the array of unique skill sets you'll be able to play with. Talking about depth, there are also job points linked to each character that you can use to unlock new abilities. These can either be active skills or passive ones that you equip yourself, and of course you have your standard fare of equipment management as you would expect in any JRPG. One final point about the combat, it helps that the battle music and to be honest all of the songs so far have been excellent to listen to, not one has disappointed me. My turn.
moving away from the blood and severed limbs now, but nonetheless something I will praise yet again, another thing that stood out to me were the characters themselves, or at least the ones I saw. Three hours gave me ample time to see two backstories, and though they were very short in terms of setting the stage, I was engrossed in both of them. The writing is decent, nothing feels wasted, and though the premise of both of these backstories was simple and nothing innovative, the execution was on point and set the foundation for the journey we will join them on. And based on what I saw on that world map, there appears to be a bunch of side stories linked to these characters that will only enrich the individual narratives further. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to partake in this since it was one of the only things the demo didn't allow for the time being, but all I saw were possibilities and options, wanderlust for the coming adventure. I also have to give props to the voice acting. I played with English voiceovers this time around for a change, and the voice actors for Hikari and Particio at the very least were good. They successfully evoked the characters they're portraying, and I can only hope that the quality persists over the course of the title. What real guarantee can a youngling like you offer me on its value? Hey, looks can be deceiving, my fine friend. I've been doing this for eight years now, and I know my stuff. Security is the only means by which you can assess Silver's horror quality. Overall, I had an amazing time with the Octopath Traveler 2 demo. It hits so many of the aspects that I look for in a game, and if it keeps this up in the full release, I'm confident that it will be one of my personal JRPGs of 2023, without question. As far as I'm concerned, it is a must-buy, and I will be playing it as soon as it releases on February the 24th, and that just so happens to be payday for me too, so win-win. Now, the other demo I played was for arguably the most anticipated indie title in the JRPG sphere, that being Sea of Stars. Delay from its original 2022 release, it will now be made available to the masses on August the 29th of 2023, allowing us to finally see if the involvement of impressive alumni like Yasunori Mitsuda will actually yield a memorable experience. Well, we got a little taste of what it would offer following Nintendo Direct as they too opened the gates for their hands-on demo. Now, this one was decidedly shorter. It only took me 45 minutes to complete and ended immediately after beating the first major boss. So in terms of material to work with, it's a bit more challenging than Octopath, but I'll give it a whirl. Starting with the presentation, well, it looks very nice. Crisp animations, vivid colours as befitting of the name Sea of Stars, it's just very pleasant to look at, and they've done a great job on that front. Heck, even the character art looks decent, an area that normally is overseen by most indie titles. It's also very pleasant to listen to. The sound design is on point, and so is the OST, which is kind of what I expected, since it does involve one of the best JRPG composers out there, but I'm not going to let that exempt it from praise. Nevertheless, it's not all bulge and no action. Sea of Stars, at least based on its one dungeon that I was able to partake in, demonstrated that it has solid level design as well. Multiple levels to traverse, engaging puzzles appear to be a focus, and there's incentive to explore for extra goodies, rewarding those who put in the extra effort, and that's how it should be. Oh, and this game has one of my favourite iterations of fishing in any game I've played so far. It actually makes it quite fun to partake in. Before moving on though, I do want to give a quick mention to the guidance given to the players, because there pretty much is none. There is literally an option right before you start the game called How to Play, because it doesn't give you any tutorials when you're in the game itself, outside of the odd signpost that you need to interact with anyway. Now on one side, I appreciate that approach, because modern games are over-tutorialized, when in a fair few cases they don't really need to be, case in point Pokemon. However, I do feel that for a new IP like this, where there's not really a level of familiarity outside of the JRPG mold itself, it should have something, just to get players in the frame of mind for how its gameplay works, and then once they have that basis, they can explore it further at their own leisure. It's a small gripe, but I felt it was worth mentioning. Now, the other main element I was able to experience was the combat, and it's quite ambitious as far as turn-based archetypes go. Even though the standard formula is there and standard attacks and unique skills for each member, it keeps you honest with reflexive-based mechanics. Pressing the A button at the right time will either allow you to get an extra swings for your own attack or mitigate damage from enemy attacks, and these windows are tight. It took me a while to get used to. That doesn't just apply to basic attacks either. Some of the skills on offer also use the same design, requiring good timing or holding said button for extra power. And though the how to play section states that you don't need to do this, I beg to differ. Without that extra damage or defending, I would have been wiped out several times over. It was fairly challenging. Now maybe I missed something when I explored before, but I couldn't see anything of note before I entered the dungeon and it brutalised me at some points. But this is what I like to say is a good challenge. It's not unfair, it just rewards good play and patience. 
But if you find yourself under the hammer a little, there is a relic available that basically switches the game to easy mode, so that's appreciated for accessibility purposes. Now back to the combat itself, there is also a so-called lock mechanic. At certain points, a sort of roulette will appear above an enemy showing various symbols which correspond to a particular weakness. Hitting the enemy with a matching attack will break the lock, lowering the overall damage when said attack is used, or if you manage to destroy all of them, you will cancel the ability altogether. So it's in your best interest to try and focus on the enemies that are charging up, so to speak, as you do get punished if you leave them alone. That also extends to the boss battle I played. It was fun and fluid throughout, and if Sea of Stars keeps up that facet, it's gonna be a highlight of the game for sure. And that's it really, the 45 minutes didn't really yield much else. I can't really comment on the story as there wasn't anything meaningful to latch onto and it seems the developers are holding on to it for the time being as they actively redacted certain elements of the story for spoiler purposes. So at the moment I can only say that Sea of Stars is promising, yet I would have wished there was more to work with to get a better idea, but the initial signs are good and it was made clear by the developers at the start of the demo that this game is still a work in progress so expect a couple more changes before its full release. Overall though, it was decent and I think it'll also be worth a purchase come August. Thank you for watching this video, if you liked it please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace!